The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to this distance learning session. My name is Efuba Tanto Evelyn, your geography teacher. Today we are going to have a geography lesson for opposite. Before we proceed to our lesson, we are going to correct the assignment that was given you during the previous lesson. You were asked to find out the inputs into the farming system. For the correction of the assignment, the inputs into the farming system uh, are many. Some are physical, some are human. But we're going to give some examples here because we shall be looking at these factors. So the factors are not arranged under physical or human, but we have climate, soil, relief, drainage, which are under physical inputs. Then we have capital, labor, technology, and many others that are under the human inputs. The lesson today is on factors influencing agriculture. For the lesson overview, we're going to begin with the learning objectives. This will be followed by the previous knowledge, then the real life situation, the learning activities, an exercise, the summary of the lesson, and lastly, we're going to give you an assignment that you will do for the next lesson. For the learning objectives by the end of the lesson, learners should explain the various factors influencing agriculture. For the previous knowledge, learners already have knowledge on resources and economic activities. The real life situation. The land in your village is very fertile and grows large quantities of food crops that could feed the people in nearby urban centers. Farmers, however, find it difficult to market their products and make much profit due to intermediaries who come and buy these crops at very low prices to resell in the urban centers. Question, what suggestions can you make to these farmers that can help them market their products and make much profit? We're going to see the answer to this question as we go along with our lesson. Factors influencing agriculture. What is agriculture? Agriculture is the cultivation of crops and the rearing of animals, either for home consumption or for sale. And it's a very important economic activity because it feeds the population. It's from agriculture that people have food to eat. So agriculture is practiced, practiced worldwide and involves about two thirds of the world's population. Agriculture is the backbone of certain economies, especially the economies of the developing countries. And as I said earlier, it is practiced throughout the world because people need food to eat and people need raw materials for their agro-industries that come from farming. 
As an industrial system, agriculture has inputs, processes, and outputs. We're going to begin by looking at the physical factors, and these factors we can also call them inputs into the farming system. Climate is a very important physical factor, and it is even the most important factor influencing agriculture because it affects man's activities directly, and indirectly it affects the animal kingdom, it affects vegetation. And so we're going to begin by looking at climate, which is seen through its elements of temperature. Temperature is very important when uh, farming is concerned because when we look at the world, various types of crops are grown according to the various uh, uh, amounts of temperature that prevail in those areas. In tropical areas, you have high temperature coupled with the high rainfall throughout the year, and so we have mostly tree crops that thrive here. And if we go to the areas which have low temperatures, we also have certain types of crops that grow in those areas. In Cameroon, for example, in the Western Highlands, you have uh, crops like, cash crops like coffee and tea that thrive in areas of low temperature and which are on highland areas. So temperature has uh, an influence on the type of agriculture that can be carried out in a specific area. Secondly, there is sunshine. Sunshine is also very important because in areas where certain crops are grown, crops generally they need sunshine to grow. So when you have an area where cereals are grown, cereals need abundant rainfall. And when they are getting to maturity, they need sunshine so that the grains can ripen. So sunshine is very important as it helps crops especially to ripen and also crops to grow well. The next thing is moisture, which is very, very important. Soil moisture. If there is no soil moisture, crops cannot grow because crops cannot grow in a dry soil. So soils need moisture, and this moisture comes from rainfall or from snow melts and, from, and from, even from dew. So moisture is very important because the moisture enables the plants to grow. Wind too can also be an influential factor. In areas of very strong winds, crops can easily be destroyed. Some parts of Yaoundé, especially on the southern low plateau, when there are strong winds, it's, not, it's very uncommon to see plantains that have been destroyed, to see corn that has been pushed down when the corn is not ready. And very often farmers may, may have problems and they may not have a very good harvest because of wind. But in areas where there is less wind, it's obvious there will be no destruction to crops. The length of the growing season is also important. Crops have their growing seasons. They are short cycle crops and they are long cycle crops. And these crops need the necessary temperature and rainfall to be able to grow well. When there is a longer growing season, normally there will be many more crops that are grown than when there is a shorter growing season because short cycle crops are very few as compared to long uh, cycle crops, crops that have longer growing seasons before they mature. The next factor is relief or topography. Hill slopes are very good for pastoral farming. Why? This is because the soils are always shallow, especially on steep slopes. But hill slopes where cattle can graze, where, where pastoral farming can take place, this, the, the soils are not always very deep, but they can sustain the growth of pasture. And so on hill slopes, 
like on the Adamawa Plateau and on the Western Highlands, in the Western Highlands, there is pastoral farming. Certain crops can also thrive on hill slopes. I made mention of tea and coffee that thrive, especially Arabica coffee, that thrives in the Western Highlands. Steep slopes are risky zones. First, they have very shallow soils because they are steep and any regolith that is lying on the, on the, the slope will be washed down to the low-lying areas. So very shallow soils are found here. And so where there are steep slopes, normally farming cannot take place in that area. Now, the increase in population, the increase in world's population in many areas, like in India, has pushed people to, to upland areas. And in other areas, it is something, some kind of historical factor like on the Mandaras in Cameroon, when during the, 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 the jihads, people who did not want to be Islamized, they ran up to the Mandara mountains and every effort that the government has made to bring them down has not been very effective. And so many of them are still in those areas. These people, they use specific techniques like terracing and contour plowing sometimes, especially terracing, to carry out cultivation. But generally, farming in those areas is with a lot of difficulty. But since these people have been on, in those areas for long, they have adapted themselves to the area and they can be able to farm without any problem. Contrary to hilly areas, low-lying areas are areas that are intensively tilled. First, the soils that are washed down from hilly areas are laid down in low-lying areas. So very often, low-lying areas are fertile and they can accommodate crop growth. We can give good examples of the Ndok Plain, of the Mbo Plain in Donga Mantung, of the Mbo Plain, and many other plains that are lying in between uh, hilly areas. These plains are intensively tilled because of good soil that is found here, especially alluvial soil that has been deposited on flood plains along rivers in such areas. We'll also note that there are some lowlands that can hinder agriculture. You may have a swampy area which is very flat. People cannot farm there. You may have a desert area which is very flat, people cannot farm there, or a thickly forested area with huge trees that need to be cut down. Farming is always hindered in those areas despite the flatness of the relief. For soils, soils are very, very important for agriculture, especially for crop farming. When it concerns the pH of the soil, acidic soils are infertile. Soils must have a pH of about seven to be fertile. Anything below seven will be acidic. Anything above seven will be more alkaline. So when soils are more, either more alkaline or more acidic, they cannot accommodate the growth of crops. So when they are at seven, when the pH is seven, the soil is fertile and can accommodate crop growth. For the texture, the texture of the soil is the proportion of sand, silt, and clay. Now, when you have sandy soils, sandy soils are soils that are very loose, and so they cannot hold water. So crop growth there is sometimes not easy because water easily drains through and the plants, the water is not available to the plants. But then we have certain crops that do well in areas of sand, like uh, groundnuts. Where you have much clay, clay soil can hold water very well, but it is waterlocked, and water cannot actually uh, infiltrate through clay soil. So clay soil can hold water, but it's very heavy too to till when it is wet, so it hinders agriculture. Silt is friable and loose, 
but it is better than the other types. So it can, it can hold, it can accommodate uh, some crop growth because silt is material that has been transported in suspension by rivers and laid down in floodplains. Those are, that can be alluvium too. When we look at the structure, which is the, the, the sizes of the particles, there are various structures. Structures that can hinder plant growth will be platy structure, columnar, blocky, prismatic. They will hinder crop growth. The best structure of the soil that can permit the growth of crops is the crump structure because it is aerated. And so water can penetrate, there is air, and crops can do very well. For organic matter content, humus rich soils like the tropical black earths and the chenozems are the best soils for plant growth. Others that do not have much organic matter will not uh, permit ground, uh, plant growth or will hinder plant growth to a certain extent. Well aerated soils will permit the infiltration of soil moisture, which can also enable crops to grow well. But those ones that do not have poor spaces cannot enable, they are waterlocked, as we said, like glare soils, like bog and peat. They cannot allow crops to grow well in such areas. Despite the fact that there are problems with soils, Frantic efforts are being made by people to improve on soils. For heavy soils, they need to till them, and uh, sometimes they have to fertilize to enable crops to grow. And for light soils, they need to also add fertilizers so that the crops can do well. For the biotic factor, we have a number of things. There are the weeds in areas where you have much weed. Weed will normally compete with crops for soil nutrients. And so the crops will not do well. Reason why people have to weed their farms and read the farm of weed that competes with plants for plant nutrients so that the plants can do well. Parasitic plants also destroy crops. So in areas where there are parasitic plants, for instance, you have pear trees. Pear trees usually have parasitic plants. When they begin there, they can kill the pear, the pear tree and take over, and so the pear tree will not pre uh, produce well. So where there, is, there are parasites on especially tree crops, the crops will not do well. Insect pests and animals are also a factor that can influence agriculture where the insect pests, like locusts in the Sahel region, where they exist, they destroy crops and cause crop failures. Where you have animals like elephants in the north of Cameroon, you also have uh, 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 rabbits in Australia, they are very, very destructive. Where they exist, crops will not do well, they will normally destroy crops. And people usually take preventive measures maybe to spray, to spray farms with pesticides, insecticides, or fungicides, where you have plant diseases, they need to get rid of these things to enable crops to grow. Now we'll go into the human and economic factors. The first one is capital, which is very, very important. Capital availability will determine the type of farming that can take place. When it is mechanized farming, they need much capital for the inputs. They need to buy machines. They need to buy pesticides, fungicides, fertilizers. And so where there is much, uh, much capital, normally there will be very large farms and a large production. The contrary is in areas where there is little capital. When farmers do not have much capital, they cannot be able to provide inputs for their farms and so the, <coughs> excuse me, the production will not be much. First of all, their farms will be small. They don't have machines to plow and they don't have fertilizer sometimes to apply on the farms. They end up with little production. 
Demand is also very important. When we talk of demand, we are referring to the population that is available to buy what is produced. Normally, farmers produce what could be sold so that they can be able to make profit. So when there is a high demand for their products, normally they are going to produce more. But where there is a decreased demand, when farmers produce their crops and the crops are not sold, they, they will not be motivated to produce much. And so this can hinder production. Now we see the case of the developing countries. Their cash crops have had a lot of fluctuation of prices on the market. And uh, when we take the case of coffee, like in the Northwest region where people produce Arabica coffee, presently very few people are producing coffee because coffee has suffered price fluctuations on the market and the farms too have grown old and farmers are not able to uh, 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 provide fertilizers for the farms. So many of those farms have been turned into food crop farms. And so when there is a high demand, normally there will be much production. Where there are price fluctuations, farmers are not encouraged to produce more and this can hinder production on a large scale. Transport is also a very important factor. Rural areas are the agricultural workshops of the world and the consumption centers are not the rural areas because in rural areas, everybody cultivates crops. So the consumption centers are the urban areas and therefore there is need for a link between the rural and the urban areas. Where there is good, where there are good transport systems, especially roads, farm to market roads, it is very obvious that farmers will be able to acquire farm inputs from urban areas. And when they have produced the crops, they are able to sell their crops because they can easily transport crops from the farms to the market. In many parts of Cameroon, this has been a very, very big problem to farmers. That is a post-harvest problem. Farmers harvest their crops. They stay for week, weeks on end. They don't see a car that can carry plantains, uh, vegetables, and other products to the market. And very often they lose a, a, a big part of their production because of no transport. The roads are seasonal. They are difficult to be plied during the, 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 the rainy season because of mud. During the dry season, even when there's dust, they can manage it. But during the rainy season, it's a big problem. Speed, cost, and frequency of transport services can also determine farming systems. Speed is very important. In developed countries, it's very easy for milk and flowers from Holland to be flown to other countries of Western Europe. So speed needs some kind of efficiency in transport systems so that crops can be delivered fresh on the market, especially market garden crops. Market gardening crops, and uh, like you have dairy products too, they need speed so that they can be delivered fresh on the market. Then there's also the problem of bulky products. Bulky products require efficient transport systems. In areas where there are railway lines, they can carry coffee, cocoa, they can transport certain crops uh, by rail. And also where there are good roads, special trucks that transport uh, farm products can also move uh, uh, the products to the market. In Cameroon, we have plantains, we have cocoa yams, we have bags of beans and corn coming from various parts of Cameroon. And these products require an efficient transport system to be moved to the market. Where they are available, it is good. Where they are not, av they are not available, there is a problem to the farmers. Today, governments of various countries are, especially the developing countries, where farming is the backbone of their economies. They are trying to improve on transport systems by creating new farm to market roads, maintaining old ones and tiring some so that people can easily move their farm produce to the markets. 
for labor. In developed countries, there is mechanization and very little labor is needed because most of the work is done by the machines. So where you have mechanization, there will be large farms. Where there is no machines, it is labor intensive. Where there is surplus and cheap labor, intensive farming is carried on. This is typically in, developed in, in the developing countries. Even in developed countries, intensive farming does not require heavy machinery. There is also the fact that some labor provision is seasonal. In countries where you have, like in Cameroon, during the harvesting period for cocoa, in the Mbam area or in areas where the, the cocoa is grown, the higher labor, people come in seasonally to work on the farms to help harvest. And when the cocoa season is over, they go home waiting for the next time. So people, even in international uh, migration, you have cross-border migrations because of the seasonality of labor. Improved technology today has led to uh, machines, many machines that plow, machines that weed, machines that harvest, like combined harvesters. So where these are available, production will be very high. Where these are not, then the work will be labor intensive. Government influence is also very important. Government provides subsidies and loans to farmers to enable them carry on with their activities. Loans are given at lower rates so that farmers can be able to loan. Government in another way can also come through cooperatives. Now government helps the farmers to get these subsidies and loans through cooperatives where they can be able to either get uh, 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 their farm inputs at lower prices in bulk or sell out their products. In that case, they have a higher bargaining power because they will be facing the market as a large group. Government too has provided research institutions where there is research on new uh, plant and animal species and high yielding varieties and quick maturing species. We have uh, the example of Irat in Cameroon for crop production, IRZ, for animal research like at Wakwa. There are also agricultural development schemes. Government has provided multipurpose river schemes like LACDO, there's a multipurpose river scheme. It is used for irrigation, it's used for transport and all of those things. So it helps even in uh, uh, providing uh, at the, 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 the areas adjacent to the lake, provide pasture for livestock and also water for irrigation. Then there are state-owned farms that the government has created, like the CDC and the, 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 the farms, heavy cam for rubber, the soccer palm, and all the others. Those are farms that the government has created to encourage agriculture in the country. There is also the creation of agricultural schools. You have agricultural faculties in the various universities of Chang, Boya, in Marwa, and then in these areas, technicians and engineers are trained. And when they come out, they can be able to work hand in glove with the farmers. There's also the creation of cooperatives that give advice to farmers, provide loans, and market the products of these farmers. We have the Inso Cooperative Marketing Association, the Nkambe Cooperative Marketing Association. There is even the General Northwest Marketing Association. And all of these help farmers in one way or the other. There are agrarian uh, reforms that have been carried out by the government, system of owning land. People can buy and own their land, and so they can be able to improve on their land so that it can produce well. Some of the, the, the government has also gone to privatize parastatal, that is state-owned uh, uh, farms so that people can be able to work and produce more. Example of Hevecam and the CDC, part of the CDC plantations. Agricultural agencies have also been created. We have Soweda in the Southwest. We have uh, Mideno 
in the Northwest that help to educate the, the, the public and uh, they help the farmers in one way or the other. Agricultural shows have also been organized time and again to motivate the farmers in their work. Then within the farming system, we have processes of clearing farm plots, planting crops, weeding, spraying and harvesting, and the outputs from the system are the various crops that are harvested and the animal products like milk, height and skin and the rest. We have an exercise put through or false against the, 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 the question. The first one, agriculture is the most important economic activity in the developing countries, it is true. Climate is the most important factor that influences agriculture, we said it, it is true. Crop farming is better on steep slopes, it's false, because they are shallow soils. Cereals thrive best in areas of, of abundant rainfall and sunshine, that is very true. Market gardening requires heavy mechanization, which is not true. The summary of the less raining activities, agriculture is the cultivation of crops and the rearing of animals for domestic consumption or for sale. It is the most important economic activity and involves about two thirds of the world's population and is the backbone of some economies, especially those of the developing countries. And as an industry, agriculture has input processes and output. For next lesson, the assignment is to find out the various types of agricultural systems. There we have the references, the books we have used, and the next lesson will be on types of farming systems. <laughs> Manetambia niña ne injo biayen.